Dr. J.B. Dias. <laughs> Can I, can I just sit here and stare at you for a while, man, and just kind of soak this all in that I'm actually sitting down with you, man, like the king of jazz education on jazz piano skills. I am thrilled. Welcome, my friend. Well, you're too kind, first of all, <laughs> and Bob, it's great to be with you today. Oh, man. I, I tell you what, we have so much to talk about. And so, you know what? I want to just, I want to jump in, and before we get into all the you know, before we get into jazz education, before we get into all the wonderful work you're doing at the Herbie Han- Hancock Institute, before all that, I mean, you know what I want to do, JB? I want you to take some time right now, and I want you to tell us about you, your childhood, your parents, siblings, how you got into music. How did this journey that you have been on your entire life, how did it start? So, my friend, I'm turning the microphone over to you. It's all yours. Well, it's a pretty circuitous route. Um, I grew up in New York, right in Greenwich Village. Wow. And I grew up in a theatrical family. My dad was a director-producer, and my mother was an actress. So the arts were always around us. Um, My dad uh, had a summer theater in Saugatuck, Michigan. We would go there every summer for 17 summers. Wow. And... Since the time I was three years old, I worked in every phase of the theater. I worked in the light booth. I worked in the sound booth. I cleaned dressing rooms. <laughs> I helped. My sister was a costumer. I helped her there. Right. I filled the Coke machines. I worked in the box office. I cleaned the bathrooms, <laughs> acted in the plays, played drums in the pit <laughs> before I could really play drums. Still can't. I'm right. a bass player. <laughs> right. But, you know, how hard could it be? <laughs> right. <laughs> when you're when you're 11 years old, you know. Yeah, exactly. Just... Right. So, uh, so all my growing up, and my dad was, frankly, medium successful. Okay. He he had he had one Broadway hit called "Send Me No Flowers" in the in the 60s. But you know he was in work, out of work, in work, out of right. work. I mean, I remember growing up, he's home all the time, and then he's gone all the time. Right. So it. So my my dad would always say, Jim, Billy, stay out of the theater. You don't need this. It was great that I did all the theater jobs at the, at the Summer Stock Theater because you're learning life skills, right. but stay out of the theater. Right. You, you, you don't need this. I, I will support you. I will send you to college, but not if you're going to be a theater major. You don't need this kind of wow. life. Yeah, right. And, and so finally, I'm, I'm 12 years old. And I finally come to him and I say, Dad, I decided what I'm going to do. You're right. The theater is just too shaky. And he says, great, son. I'll send you to school, whatever you want to do, just not the theater. He says, so what are you going to do, son? And I said, jazz music. (laughs) I I bet he went, oh, such a relief. (laughs) So. So that was that was a big joke in our family. Yeah. So um, actually, you know, I got I started as a rock and roll. I'm a bass player now, but right. I started out as a rock and roll guitar player. Right. And right after high school, by the way, I never wanted to go to college. Um, I mean, I had it. You know, I've been to school for twelve yeah, years. I'm right. a senior in high school. The last right. thing I want wanted to do, and I was a good. Uh, I was I was a good rock and roll guitar player. I I thought I was a lot better than what I was, so I carried myself that way because you know you know I was like I was probably the best rock guitar player in my high school. So you know, <laughs> yeah, right. So therefore, you're the best hot rock and roll yeah. guitar player. Yeah. So you know, I, I thought it was you know, Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, J. B. Dias. <laughs> right. I, not, I, necess- I, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> I, I mean, I was so. I w- man, I mean, it's embarrassing. So anyway, <laughs> right after high school, I luck into a, a going on the road with a rock band, playing six nights a week in hotel lounges. And this was yeah, in, sure, this right. was in the seventies, where every every hotel, every Sheridan, Marriott, right. Right. Holiday Inn, right. they all had top forty right. bands. Yep. in the lounge. That's right. And so I looked into this really good group and 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 I remember uh, I'm I'm only 18 years old and I'm traveling around the country and making more money than my dad. So the last thing 
that I'm thinking about is going to college. But um, so anyway, the the bass player and the keyboard player in the group, they were both into jazz. And they were carrying around like a footlocker of albums, mm -hmm. a lot of CTI records, oh, you yeah. know. Yeah. And so we would play in a, in a club for two weeks, Monday through Saturday, have the Sunday off, Monday through Saturday, then we're on the road. We were booked all over the country through a, wow. a booking agency that probably wow. had 40 or 50 of these groups crisscrossing yeah. the country. And, and Hey, and at 18, man, that's the life right there, man. I was having a ball. Yeah, I was right. having a ball. So they were into jazz. They were always listening to jazz. And so then on one of the Sundays, they say, hey, we're going to a jam session, one of our days off, going to a jam. Come on, JB. Come on, bring your racks. You can sit in. And I and thinking that I'm all that, you know, sure, man. So <laughs> I I go up and 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 see, I really couldn't improvise because in, in what I would do is I would solo every night in the top 40 band the exact same yeah, right. solos that were on the record. Right, right. And so I remember they come up and they they bring me up to play on Green Dolphin Street and they had the real book up there. And I just absolutely fell on my face. It was just awful. Mm. And so for the first time, I realized that I was nowhere. Yeah. I was nowhere. And so I said, how did you guys learn how to do this? How did you guys learn how to like, read chord symbols and read music and, and be able to improvise like that? Yeah. And I really respected these guys because they were older and right. wiser. I mean, right. one was 19, the other one was 20. <laughs> so yeah. they've been around. <laughs> right. yeah. So I said... Yeah, you're hanging your hat on their wisdom. <laughs> so I said, I said, how'd you learn how to do this? And they said, we went to community college for a couple of semesters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. loser. <laughs> and they right. said, community college? I got to get me into one of those. <laughs> learn how to do this. So re I remember oh, the band funny, broke dude. up in Sioux City, Iowa, and Sioux City, Iowa, a, and because the the singer in the group they they were going to put a bigger they were putting money behind her and they were going to put a bigger band and I thought we were going to get a new singer but they just gave us a two week notice so I said well now what do I do so you know how people decide to go to college because they really want to study because of a great program they have or a great yeah, yeah, instructor right, right, there right. Right. Well, I went to, um, I went, I started, I said, I'm going to go to college now and learn how to do this. And I started at Western Michigan University yeah. in Kalamazoo. And the reason why I went there is because I had a friend who had a place who said I could stay there <laughs> until I found a place. And that's how I picked my school. Well, hey, when you're, we have, when you're 18, unemployed in Sioux City, Iowa, you're going like, all right, you, you got a place for me to stay? I'm there. Yeah. So I went oh. to school and I took it very seriously. You know, I had <laughs> I, I was the proverbial D minus student in, in, in high school. Right. And in college, I was straight A's until the second semester of my junior year. I was serious about learning how to do this. Right, right. So that's, that's how I got myself, got myself into college. And I, I remember... Getting myself into jazz, you know, on on the road when I was with those cats and the you know the nineteen and the twenty year old, and they were listening to Herbie Hancock's Chameleon mm -hmm. from right. Headhunters. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I walked in, you know, walked in in their room and they're listening. And I said, "Man, what's that?" And they said, "That's jazz." <laughs> and I said, "Jazz? I got to get me into this." <laughs> And that's that was that was my transitional tune. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing, right? And little did you know at that time, you would end up Mr. Bigwig at the Herbie Hancock Institute. I you mean, know, come on. I, I've told Herbie this story, and <sighs> it, it turns out the chameleon was the transitional tune for lots of. Uh, that's right. That's yeah, right. And, and to and to give it even more coincidence is that my other transition tune was Take Five. Wow. By the Dave Brubeck yeah, Quartet. Right. And my former gig before here was right. I was executive director of the Brubeck Institute, and I got to be very close to Dave. He became like my grandfather, one of the oh, wisest, wow. one of the wow. wisest and a, yeah. a true humanitarian. Yeah, I, always, I, 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 I never met Dave Brubeck, but I always heard that he was one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. Is that true? Salt of the earth. 
Yeah. And normal. Yeah, yeah right. Just like a regular cat and just yeah. absolutely uh, loving and yeah. deep. Yeah, that's I amazing. mean, he thought about everything, uh, uh, religion and life yeah, right. after death and politics and classical right. music and, right. The, right. you know, the, the, the world affairs. He yeah. was... Uh, he was quite something. Yeah, what a blessing for you, right? To have that kind of intimate relationship with him and and learn from him. What a what a blessing, man. Well, it, it's interesting because I was the director of education for the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz when it was at USC. Right. When I got the call to apply to the Brubeck Institute, and I applied and they offered me the position, but I had a good job. Right. So I was in one of those rare positions right. where I didn't need the gig, right. that was, which was new for me in my life because all through up, <laughs> give me a gig, anything, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, right. an annulment, give me yeah, a right. gig. <laughs> but so, right. so here oh I said, gosh. so here I said, uh, oh, that's funny. I called, um, they offered me the gig, and I said, before I take it, I'd like to spend some time with Dave just to see if we're on the same page. And right. So George Moore was his, uh, his assistant. And to show you Dave's loyalty, George Moore had been his assistant for, like, decades. Even George had grandchildren. Mm. So George said, uh, I said, I want to come to um, Connecticut where where he lives and I said I'll, I'll, I'll you know just get a hotel room and I'll stay there for two or three days and just visit Dave so he calls back and he says um, this is in Wilton Connecticut George says uh, no Dave insists that you stay at the house Dave insists that you stay and I said oh, I couldn't impose so wow I but they insisted so I went there for three days hanging out Oh my gosh! First of all, he's got pianos. He's like six or seven pianos all over, the, <laughs> oh, all over right. the house. There's the there's photos of him with kings and queens and presidents and Louis Armstrong and oh, Miles gosh. Davis and and just this most exquisite house. And he even had a even had an upright piano on stilts, golly, so that he could uh, so they could practice standing up and right standing up. He says, "Yeah, my back." Yeah, my yeah right. Back. What a great idea. So. So uh, uh, we talked about everything, and I told him my ideas for the Institute about having a fellowship program and doing jazz outreach and having a summer jazz colony for the top 17 high school kids in the country. Wow. And after that, I just knew I had to get next to him. And I was there for four years when the Thelonious Monk Institute recruited me back. They created this new position of yeah. vice president. Right. And at this time, I thought, I didn't really want to finish my career in Stockton, California. That's where the Brubeck Institute was, the University of the Pacific, although it's beautiful. Right. That was Dave's alma mater. That's why the Brubeck okay. Institute was, oh, okay. Makes was sense. there. Right. I thought if I wanted to get back to L.A. And, and so that was, uh, right. that was one of the hardest things I had to do was tell Dave that I was going, having to leave. But he completely, and, and I, you know, I went and I made an appointment because he was, he was playing in L.A. and I'm, I flew down from Stockton, and I made an appointment to go speak to him in his hotel suite after I saw his concert. And um, he said, you can tell me anything except that you're leaving. Mm, and I said, part. man, and I told him he's not buying any of it. And I said, you know, Dave, I said, I just really can't see myself finishing my career in Stockton. And he said, well, I can certainly understand that. <laughs> so... That was in August, and then uh, the next uh, New Year's Day, we talked on the phone for almost an hour, so everything was everything had been cool. Yeah. Since. yeah. How but old was he? How old was he at that time? Eighty. Wow. Okay. You know, late seventies. Yeah. So eighty. He was still, he was and still I remember old, a yeah. couple of my favorite day. I'm telling you how wise this pianist was. Um, we're talking about how every jazz musician you talk to gives you a different way they think you should learn how to play jazz. Right. That's right. Go to school. Don't go to school. Right. Use transcription books. Don't use, Don't transcription, use transcription books. books. Right. Use play alongs. Don't use play alongs. Right. And so I said, Dave, um, 
Like I know that when you would ask David Baker what the best way to learn how to play jazz was, he'd say, well, you've got to come to some place like Indiana University where, where, where it was get a degree and you right. know, do what we say. And, right. But you talk to Hal Galper, the great jazz pianist that played with Phil Woods, he would say, hey, man, if your parents have enough money to send you to college, take that money, come to New York, hang out, study with a, study with a great... Right. So everybody had different things. I know that us people would say you got to go to New York. Others would say you got to stay home and practice. Right. Terrence Blanchard would always say, you know, if you really want to be a jazz musician, you got to spend at least a couple of years in New Orleans. Right. To uh, to 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 yeah, uh, right. To soak up the ethos. Right. 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 So do you go to New York? Do you st go to New Orleans? Do you stay home and practice? Do you go to school? Do you not go to school? Do you use play-alongs? Do you not use play-alongs? So why right. ask Dave? I said, what do you think is the best way to learn how to play jazz? And he said, any way you get there is the right yeah, way. That's right. And that was just. Yeah, right. Cut wow. right to the cuts right to the chase. Yeah. Get there. My other favorite one, I said, Dave, do you play for yourself or mm -hmm. do you play for the audience? And he says, you always play for yourself unless it's a really good audience. <laughs> <laughs> right oh that's <clears throat> yeah yeah you know that's uh that's interesting because there's one of bill evans quotes that i love he says and i'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit he said uh maybe it's a peculiarity of mine but i'd much i'd much rather perform without the audience hmm yeah, every everybody's got a different take on that. Of course, we all know Miles Davis. Yeah, you know how he would, you know, face the band. Yeah, not even announce yeah. tunes. Yeah, right. Right. But um, Dave said you play for yourself and each other, meaning the rest of yeah. the quartet. Right. But if you got a good audience, you play for them. <laughs> Absolutely. You right. know, because they're into it, and that's exactly right. And and they're responding to you, and they're right. they're um, informing what you play. Right. Right. So, okay, JB, so this is fascinating. So let's go back. You're 18, unemployed in Sioux City. You end up in Kalamazoo, uh, Michigan, right? Is that where you ended up? Yes. And then, so what I was doing, I was earning my way through school. Okay. And uh, so it actually took me seven years to get my degree because I was in school, on a cruise ship, on the road, right, back to right. school, on a cruise ship, all, you know, doing the cruise gig thing. So I'm in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia, playing in a group called Last of the Good Guys. And I'm living with a vocalist and she and I break up and the band breaks up and my whole world is going dark. <laughs> I'm, you know, 21 years old. Classic. Classic. And so I do whatever, you know, red blooded American boy would do. You know, I called my mom. <laughs> What do I do? And she said, well, your dad's your dad's in Palm Beach, Florida. He's directing a play at the Royal Poinciana Playhouse. It's a six-week gig, and he's got four more weeks. Why don't you give him a call? He, he needs a drummer. <laughs> he needs a, why, don't you, why don't you just go hang out with him and figure out right. your, your next steps? Oh. So I go down there, and I, I you know, I'm... Stay with my dad. Who you know, the gig came with a two-bedroom apartment right there in Palm Beach, and nice, about nice. four blocks from the ocean. So I'm going to the beach and crying in my beer and all that stuff. And my dad said, "You know, you know, while you're here, why don't you think about um, finding some work?" <laughs> so I, um, I went around to all the music stores, everything, put my name up, and I had an. I was a gu guitar player, by that, but I had an electric bass. Because like every rock and roll guitar player, they right. can also play electric bass. Yeah, that's bass right, beat. right, right. Because you kind of, you know, when you're in the high school band, the high school garage band, rock band, you kind of trade off. That's know? right, that's right. Okay, I'll play bass on this. <laughs> right. So I found a gig, um, oh. I found a gig playing uh, with this cat named Jimmy Rivers at the Holla on electric bass, and I was there for nine weeks in Jupiter, Florida. She's north of Palm right. Beach. Right. Playing at right. the Holiday Inn. You know, my dad goes back to New York. I, I rent a cheap efficiency um, in West Palm Beach. 
And I start gigging and I'm down there. And I start and I start working. And I put together uh, this. Uh, and, and by the way, I finished my degree at Florida Atlantic University. Okay. Where there was this incredible teacher there named Bill Prince. Remember that? Oh, One yeah. of the most incredible oh, jazz yeah. music. Oh, yeah. Multi-instrumentalist. I right. mean, he, he, he got a doctorate in trumpet performance right. from the University of Miami. But he played tenor saxophone like Sonny Rollins. Right. And principal clarinet in the Jacksonville yeah. Symphony in, yeah. w- when, he moved to, w- when he moved to University of North Florida. He was at mm. Florida Atlantic University when I was there. So I yeah, did he his, go to did, did he go to North Florida? Was that with Rich Madison? That's was, correct. Yeah, with Rich Madison at that time, right? Exactly right. Yeah, he right. was at Florida Atlantic University when I was there, and then just after, uh, just I think a couple years after I graduated, he took that gig at North Florida right. and finished his teaching career there. And he's still right. he's still their professor emeritus. Okay. So I formed this group called the Kids Next Door. And this was a big hit in, in, Palm, in the Palm Beaches because we were doing all the disco tunes of the 70s. Like this was Saturday Night Fever yeah. was popular. But we, right. were also, we, we were also doing four-part vocals like the Modern Airs and singing wow. I Got a Gal in Kalamazoo and Chattanooga Choo Choo. Oh, wow. wow. So we were huge with the Palm Beach set because yeah, right. they wanted to boogie, but they were still like these older... <laughs> Older folks, so they loved it, and we had the smiles and the, yeah. and the, we were the kids next door, and so this. I, I, did, you, I, did you wear tuxes? Did you wear tuxes? When no, you but we did wear matching suits with ties and okay. <laughs> and right down to matching shoes. I mean, th- yeah. this oh, was yeah. a slick group, and yeah. all these cats in the group were really good jazz players. Right, but we're doing this. And, yeah. and we would play a jazz set often as the dinner set. We'd play stand. Yeah, right, right, uh, right. Um, but then, and we had a great singer who could could sing everything from, you know, Donna Summer to Ella Fitzgerald. Right. We're really, wow. really, uh, really lucked out on that. So I'm living the life. I'm making the most money ever made, playing with the best cats, booked all the time. Places are places are packed. People like Bob Hope and uh, and, and famous yeah. people. Uh, are coming in all the time. Lauren Green, I remember the cat right. from Bonanza. Yeah, right. <laughs> They're coming in, you know. <laughs> so I'm living the life, and I'm getting up. I'm, you know, we play, and I'm playing six nights a week, and I'm hanging out every night, and then I'm getting up at three in the afternoon. And the reason why I'm getting up at three in the afternoon every day is because that's when General Hospital came on. <laughs> The soap opera, and and I was hooked. That was the Luke and Laura days. And man, oh my gosh! So I, Bob, I had a revelation one day. I really remember this, looking in the mirror and saying, "You know, what's wrong with this picture? You're hanging out all night, and you're getting up at three in the afternoon. And the reason why you're getting up is so that you can watch General Hospital." <laughs> so. I decide to call my, oh my good gosh. friend and mentor, Bill Prince, right, who is still at FAU, Florida Atlantic mm-hmm. University, mm-hmm. and I said, can I make an appointment to talk to you? I've got some issues. And he said, sure, <laughs> J.D., <laughs> come in. Issues. So I right. told him, I said, I told him the story that I just don't feel fulfilled. I'm playing with all these cats, yeah. but, you know, I right. and he said, why don't you try teaching? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I said, well, I don't know. He said... He said, I was living the life, I was touring with Buddy Rich, and he's on three Buddy Rich records playing solo trumpet. He's on the Mercy, Mercy, Mercy record. Ah, this, this, this right. Great. right. And he said, but then I decided to start teaching. I went back, got my degrees, and now I can play whatever gigs I want. I can yep. have a semblance of a normal life. Right. Why don't you try teaching? Right. And I'm, and I'm going, well, I don't know if I'm really... Well, as fate would have it, while I'm in his office, the f- the phone rings, Holy moly. and the the dean of or the chairman of Broward Community College, which is in Fort Lauderdale, called Bill and said that he needed a, a, a guitar teacher to come in and finish the semester because his adjunct guitar teacher uh, just left in the middle of the semester to go on the road with the Pointer Sisters. 
which was a famous pop group. Yeah, right. In, in those days. Right. And so he needed somebody to come in and teach eight guitar students, or seven, or seven, seven guitar students, seven guitar students. And does Bill know anybody? And and Bill said, "Well, hold on just a <laughs> hold on just a minute." He said, "I got a gig for you right now, teaching at Broward Community College one day a week. You want to take this thing or not?" Oh my gosh! So I'm on the spot, and I go, uh, "Okay." <laughs> so I start teaching there one day a week. I'm there for eight hours. Never know. taught me. Never taught before. Never taught before. But I'm going in there, and I loved it. Yep. I loved it. So I remember the, the drummer in the band, that the kids next door, wonderful drummer, wonderful sing, singer who we just lost a couple of years ago named Tony Lavender. Because mm. all I'm doing is talking about these students and what I'm teaching them, I'm talking about it all the time. We're, we're rehearsing with the kids next door. I'm talking about these students. Wait, wait till you hear this kid, man. He can do... And so I remember Tony saying, you know, on behalf of everybody in the band, would you please shut up about your students? <laughs> yeah, right. We know... You, you, we know you like teaching them. We we got yeah, it. We got it. Yeah, we got it. So that's how I started my teaching career. So from there, I started teaching more classes at Broward. Then I got a, to, t was an adjunct at Miami Dade Community College. Uh -huh. I did my master's degree at University of Miami. Once I got my master's, they really liked what I was doing at Miami Dade, and it just turned out that somebody was retiring from mm -hmm. this from the music department at Miami Dade College. And so I was right there, just finished my master's degree, and they loved what I was doing as an adjunct, and they hired me full-time, and that was my first full-time teaching gig. That is fantastic. So then how did you end up, if I remember reading correctly, weren't you at the University of Indiana? Is that where you did your doctorate? Yes, I did my doctorate at Indiana. And the, Indiana University, yeah, right. At Indiana University, and the, and the way that happened was I was teaching at... Uh, at Miami Dade Community College, and then also added to that in the late '80s was New World School of the Arts, All right, which is the right. performing arts high school, which right. they built right there on the campus. Right. So I was there. So I was now the director of jazz studies at New World and at Miami Dade. I kind of right. I, uh, my load was split be between the between, two. Right. Right. So every year we brought down visiting artists, and uh, and we brought down Jamie Abersold. We would bring a visiting artist for three days. They would, they would clinic the band for three days and then be the performer at our final concert. This was right. always at yeah. the end of the school year. Right. So I had Jamie Abersall come down, and Jamie did uh, his thing and loved, apparently, what I did because he offered me to teach at the camp, at his, right. at his jazz camp that summer. Right. Went to the jazz camp. To, as a teacher, and the first morning session was jazz theory and improvisation, and only, and there were just four people that taught it. Dave taught David Baker taught the most advanced, and then Dan Hurley taught the second one yep. from the University of North Texas. Yep. And then Jamie taught the third one. That was the biggest one. Right. That's like the lower intermediate. And right. then there was a there was what we call drummer's theory where all the drummers were in there, and they were just basically teaching them. It was in a piano lab, just basically right. teaching them piano. So everybody else who taught at the camp didn't have anything to do uh, that hour, that 90 minutes in the morning. Right. We right. started, we, that started at 8.30, right. and we started at 10. Right. So I went to David's class just like a student. Right. And I did that for... I, I was at Jamie's camp for 30 years. I did that all the way up until David stopped doing the camps. Yeah. Uh, and I learned more from David's class. And while I was there, he said, if you want to do your doctorate in Indiana, we'll give you what they called an associate instructorship, right. Right. which is a little better than a grad assistant. It covers right. your tuition plus a little better stipend. And right. that's why Indiana happened, thanks to wow. Jamie Abersold and, and my going <sighs> to David's class. And I did that class for about literally every summer for 20 years. And then uh, the person who was doing the drummer's theory retired, and I started doing that okay. with, with the drum, basically drummers and vocalists. And, but for that first 20 years or so, I was there just like a student soaking yeah. up. The, and I remember it, I said it took me about 10 years to you know, get that first session under my fingers. 
Yeah. It you was know, intense. Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> talk about rubbing elbows with the best players and educators that you could possibly rub elbows with, right, at, at those camps. Yes, I learned so much about teaching from David. Yes, and 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 you know, and I don't teach like David, but he informs everything I do. The same thing with Jamie. And I remember David would always talk about when you become a jazz player, because a lot of times people would criticize David Baker. Uh, t- because he would have people do trans- a lot of transcriptions and and they right. would learn licks and they learn two fives in all keys and turnarounds right. and all this kind of thing. Right. And so when they would play it, oftentimes it would sound like they are, pu- you know, putting them, uh, you know, the Frankenstein monster together. C- correct. But, right. But David would always say, no, 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 this is your point of departure. That's right. It, it's like learning a language. You've got to learn yeah. phrases and all this kind of thing. But you, then when you go to write your novel or write your book of poetry, you've got to put it, you, you got to use what you know, but you've got to do it your own, own yeah, way. I, and I 100% agree with that. It's a launching pad. It's meant to, to, to set you free, actually. And that's exactly right. And that's exactly what he said about teaching. He said, yeah. I want you to absorb everything that I'm doing and what Jamie's doing and what right. Bill Prince is doing and right. Witt Seidner at the University of Miami. Yeah. And, but then you, that's your point of departure and you have to do it your own way. So I treat jazz education as an art form. Yes. Just like jazz is an art form. Thank you very I, much. I have, yes. I have transcribed the best teachers, learning right. from the best teachers, you so, you know, so right. to speak, transcribe, right. quote, unquote. Right. But then I put that into my own pot and I mix it with my own experiences. And so just like just like when I play uh, Ray Brown and Christian McBride and Ron Carter, they all inform what I do. Right. And Jocko. Right. They inform what I do. But no one would think I'm them. That's for sure. Right. So. Uh, and the same way with teaching, you know. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. That is exactly right. You know, uh, I'm curious. So, when did you make? When did the transition the, uh, from guitar to bass happen? To where you you, you made that decision? I, I, I'm a bassist. What happened was I when I went to Florida, and I was looking for any kind of gig I could find, guitar or bass. I had an electric bass, and I got that gig playing in a lounge act with that guy Jimmy Rivers. That's when I started playing bass. And then I got electric bass. And then I got branded as a bassist. I got brand- And so then when mm-hmm. I decided to go back to school, because I did my undergrad degree in jazz guitar performance. Okay. And w- when I went back to, to get my master's degree, to start my master's degree four years later, my bass chops were the ones that were up. Because that's what I was working on, yeah, right. and I was playing over three hundred dates a year. I mean, I was wow. I was working. I mean, I, wow. I was working big time. I mean, with the kids next door, we were you know six nights a week, uh, with with only two weeks off, and we played in the same room for three years in wow. uh, the the Flame in North Palm Beach. Right. So I was working a lot, and and those chops were up. So when I went to the University of Miami for my masters. I was a uh, jazz pedagogy major with bass principal. Wow, fantastic! Okay, wow, what what a story! What a story, JB! <laughs> it's amazing. So here I am. I'm coming to you from LA now, Los Angeles at, at UCLA, my office here at the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz Performance. Yeah, and uh, it's yeah, it, you know, it's been a ball, and it still is. Well. Yeah, it's it's awesome. Your contributions and what you've done for jazz education uh, is nothing short of miraculous. It's fantastic. So I want to talk a little bit before we get into the Herbie Hancock, what you're doing there at the Herbie Hancock Institute and and all the wonderful work that you're doing with kids. Let's kind of just talk a little bit about jazz education uh, uh, generically for for a moment. You know, because um, I know you deal with kids uh, adult people of all ages that are interested in wanting to uh, develop their jazz skills but let's let's talk about the beginner the beginning the beginning jazz student right uh, most students get into jazz after they've gotten into music right just like you did just like I did um, 
And so here we go. Here's a, here's a young man, young woman wanting to learn how to play jazz. What what's the what's the very first thing that which you, if you sit down with a, a student right out of the block, you know, wanting to learn how to play jazz, what's the first thing you do with them? What's the first thing you talk about? What's the first thing you do? Well, especially when I'm working with a jazz pianist, and I teach a lot of uh, I teach a lot of jazz piano. Primarily to uh, students who are not pianists, but when I have mm-hmm. a beginning student that's never played jazz before, and, and but it has some chops, you know, they can play right, for release right. or you right. know, rocks right. minuet in G and so forth. Uh, the first thing that I, the first thing that I let them do, the first thing that I do is show them and talk about how jazz works, and so. I always like to use the tune "Song for My Father" because there's only mm-hmm. four chords and mm-hmm. it, does, it it's a straight eighth groove, mm-hmm. and so I talk about and I play the recording for them and I have a lead sheet there in 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 front in front of them, and we listen to the tune and I explain what a chorus is, mm-hmm. and I say what you have to understand is that in jazz there's a set of chord changes, and every time we go through that set of chord changes we call that a chorus. Now, a lot of times they've heard the term chorus before, but they've always thought it meant something different. Correct. Like in Correct. rock and roll, it's the middle part. That's right. That's or right. In, 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 here at UCLA, it's the uh, a group of singers. Like we have the men's chorus and the all-campus chorus and the women's chorus. Um, in musical theater chorus, those are all those that didn't get a speaking part. You, you you put them in the chorus, right? You put them in the chorus, <laughs> You're right? So it's all, it's got all these different meanings. So I said, so it depends on the kind of music you're talking about. So when we talk about a chorus in jazz, I always say it means one time through the chords of a tune. And in jazz, what they do is they take that set of chords and they play it over and over and over and over and over again. And the reason why it never gets boring is because every time they go through that chords something else happens. Mm -hmm. And I say, and what makes it so exciting is because the audience doesn't know what's going to happen next because the musicians themselves (laughs) don't know what's going to happen next. (laughs) Right. And I say, it's different in classical music. Right. If you you listen to the New York Philharmonic play the Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and then you go, uh, the uh, the Beethoven's Fifth, and then you go hear the Chicago Symphony play it, yeah. Yes, there'll be a different interpretation and so forth, but you know what notes are coming yeah, next. Yeah, right, right. So, so that's the first thing. I want to make sure they understand that. Then, and so we go through it together, and we and I talk about the form. Yep. And how, see, this first eight measures, and then that's repeated. So that's A, and then the second A, and then the next eight measures is different, is B, and then they do it all again. So it's A, A, B. And there's eight measures in each of the three sections. So there's 24 measures. Yeah. And so we'll go through it. And the first time, I say the first time, they always play the head. And I explain that the head is the melody. Right. The first time through is the melody. And I say we call it the head because jazz musicians, they have their own lingo for everything. That's right. And I say, you know, I've been a professional musician since I've been 15. And in all these years, never once have I gone to my job with my with my instrument to make some money by playing with the other fellows some toe tapping music <laughs> but but you go to your gig with your axe <laughs> make some bread playing with the other cats hopefully you kill and set what 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 did you say what, did, <laughs> what was that I, <laughs> so yeah that's we, exactly right and and, and, oh. I, and so I say we play the head in the beginning, oh. and we play it at the end. Right. And then everything else, the solos are all in the middle. And every right. every uh, jazz musician can solo for as long as they want within reason. Right. And I said some like I said you can listen to some of those Coltrane records where he, he would sometimes play a hundred choruses. I, I always talk about how when Miles and Train were playing at the village gate and Miles would play his, you know, three or four choruses and Coltrane would come up there. Miles would go down two blocks to the deli, get a ham sandwich, <laughs> have it come back and be in time to play the head at the end. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, yeah, I heard at one time, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard one time Coltrane said the Miles after like taking 100 courses or something saying, you know, man, sometimes I just can't stop playing. And I guess the, the story goes that Miles said, well, why don't you try taking your horn out of your mouth? Why <laughs> yeah, try taking the horn out of your mouth. Yeah, so I say, you know, sometimes it's just not that deep. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. So so we go through it we go through it together. Yeah. And and I and I explain that jazz is like a sandwich. You got one piece of bread at the top, that's the first time they play the head, got it yep. at the bottom. Yeah. And then in the middle, all the delicious yep. yeah, all the good right. stuff it's is. It's a great in the way middle. to put it. Yeah, that's Because you'd never go to the subway over here and order a bread sandwich. You care yeah, about uh, yeah, what's right, in the middle. Right. That's but right. I also talk about the head still has to be good. Still sure has to does. feel good, swing. That's right. And uh, and I tell the story that, you know, International Jazz Day uh, seven years ago was in Paris, and and the the Herbie Hancock Institute we facilitate International Jazz Day along with UNESCO, which is right. an arm of the United Nations. Yeah. So I finally, something I wanted to do all my life was to see the Mona Lisa, mm -hmm. and the Mona Lisa is at the Louvre in in Paris. So you wait in line, you wait in line, and you finally get up there and you get to see her, but, but, but just for a minute because they got to keep the line moving. Yeah, right. And I, and I remember just seeing that it was ex, uh, exquisite, of course. Right. Of course. And, uh, and you know, one of the things that interest, was so surprising was she wasn't that big. I thought she was going to be yeah, huge. Yeah, right. Yeah, right, right. She's just like an average-sized painting. And then just as I was leaving, I looked back and I... And I saw, boy, they really put a nice frame. They really had a nice frame around her. Because you have to have a nice frame on the Mona Lisa. You can't just yeah, thumbtack her to the wall. Correct, right. But nobody stood in line for two hours to see the frame. That's correct. Had to have it. Had, had to, to be good. It. Right. You know, the frame probably cost five grand or something. Yeah, right. It was a gorgeous right. frame. Yeah. And, um, but no one stood in line to see the frame. And so the same thing in jazz... Yeah. Of course, we want to hear the head. Of course, it has to be in tune. Of course, it has to right. sound good. But the most important part is in the yeah. middle. Yeah, yeah. So then we go through and we play just the roots of the chords. Very just important. Just the roots yep. of the chords yep. with the record with the recording. So they're yep. hearing the definitive recording. Then yep. I show them some voicings mm. to play. Only four chords, and they play the voicings. Then I show them one-handed voicings. Yep. So the two-handed voicings, then one-handed voicings. Mm -hmm. Then we go through and we improvise just using just using two notes, just using the root and third. There you go. There you go. So so I will I'll do something like um root third boot third root root third third root and say yeah. what made it interesting the rhythm. <laughs> there you so go. So maybe some Nothing yeah. but roots and thirds. Yeah, that's right. And then we add fifths and so forth. Then we transcribe some of Horace's solo. Yeah, right. And we say, now insert. But don't right. make it sound like you're inserting. Try to have it get there organically. Yeah. And then, so the way that I teach is this. We just go, we, we learn tunes. And each, to, each subsequent tune uses something from the previous tune. Right, right. And then you need to use the material that you learned on the previous tune on the subsequent tune. So right. after Song from My Father, which has F minor in it, we now learn Cantaloupe Island, there you which go. has F minor. So now you yep. can use some F minor stuff that Horace Silver played yep. or Joe Henderson played, right. depending on if they have the chops for it. The great thing about Horace's solo, it's easy. Right. Technically. I mean, right. it's just, right. it's just right. brilliant. And that's right. the other thing they realize. Uh, uh, difficult and brilliant aren't synonymous. You can have right. something difficult and terrible and something easy and brilliant and vice versa. Correct. Anytime. Correct. So that's basically the gist. Yeah. I have a list of 25 tunes. Yeah. Each one starting easy. Each one uses something from the previous tune. Yeah. So you, you learn a, what you need to do to play yeah. on that tune rather you, than doing two fives in all keys yeah. or turnarounds in all right. keys. And, that's, and after you learn those 25 tunes, 
you're on your way. Yeah, that's fantastic. Do you have a list of those tunes on the Herbie Hancock Institute page or something? No, I have it on my website. I absolutely you, do. Okay, I'm going to make sure we get a link to that so so listeners can go check that out. Yeah, I have the list of I have the list of the 25 tunes in order. Yeah. So that every subsequent tune uses something from the previous tune. I also have yeah, a link nice. to the definitive recording. Oh, that's fantastic. And a listing of the personnel, because they say never not know who you're listening to. Yeah, that's fantastic. Even if you have to pull yeah. off to the side and look it up. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then after you do the 25, I have my list of 104 must-know tunes. Yeah. And these are the 104 must-know tunes, and I have them the first 52 and the second 52. Yeah. And, the, and these are all standards and tunes that yeah. are played at jam sessions and gigs yeah. and so forth. And so the idea, Bob, is that the first 52 are a little bit easier than the second 52. Yeah. But also, if, if you're a jazz musician and you don't know, if you get called a, a, a tune called on that first list of 52, yeah. you're going to be really embarrassed. Right, right. If you don't know it. And on the yeah, second right. list of 52, you'll still be embarrassed, but not as embarrassed. <laughs> So funny. You're taking me back. I remember, I can't remember what magazine it was. Keyboard magazine, I guess, when it was around. Uh, Dick Hyman posted, a, a had an article, 100 tunes that every jazz musician should know. And boy, I started working on those 100 tunes. And then uh, right away. And then the next month, he had another article, 100 more tunes every jazz musician should know. I said, what the heck? You know, in the next month, 100 more jazz. You know, I'm going, I can't keep up. Uh, but that's fantastic. That, that, that is awesome. You and, know, and the reason for the 52, or the 104, one tune a week I for two just, years. I was just going to say, I knew, there was, I knew there was some formulaic approach to that. I and, knew and, it. And, then, and by the way, once you learn those 104, Dick Hyman's next 104, Dick Hyman's next 104, <laughs> so much easier because you're saying, well, this is, this is just like this, except it's... Oh, listen, I'll tell you a really quick story. 